continuing on with 31, here we have a pretty simple question about what's the equilibrium expression for this particular reaction. Only key to know here is that your solids and liquids have an activity of one, they're constant, and so those are not going to factor into the equilibrium expression. We're really just looking at the oxygen gas and the hydrosulfuric acid. So we're looking for one just the two of them. That's D here. We have hydrosulfuric acid to the eighth power and the pressure of oxygen to the fourth power. D would be our choice. Okay, in 32, the easiest way to do this is with the Le Chandelier principle. Um, so we know that uh, the reaction is exothermic. For exothermic reactions, one of the things that I like to do is I like to go ahead and add an energy term. And then I treat that as a product or reactant. Now, really, that's not what's going on. Uh, really, it's not that I've added energy and then therefore it's caused a shift because of some you know, feelings hurt. But rather, uh, this gives me a simple way to make that prediction. Okay, so it's kind of a shortcut to knowing how to actually do it. In reality, changing the temperature of a reaction speeds up the reaction rates for the forward and reverse unevenly. And it's going to affect it to cause, in a way that causes that shift anyways. Okay, so the volume of the reaction vessel is tripled. So if the volume increases, that means that the pressure decreases. Okay, so if we're gonna use Le Chatelier's principle, we can say, okay, which side has fewer gas molecules? And that would be, uh, this side has fewer, this one has more. And so if the pressure goes down, we're going to shift to the left. We're going to increase our PCL3 and CL2, but decrease our PCL5. So therefore, A is not the correct choice. Uh, if the reaction vessel is cooled, we're decreasing this. We're going to therefore shift to the right. And that is going to increase our PCL5, so that should be our answer. If we remove CL2, that's going to cause an increase to the left. Uh, so that is not going to increase our PCL5. And then adding an inert gas does not change anything because you're not changing any of the reaction collisions. Now, in reality, this change and this change are actually really just a change uh, where you're not in equilibrium because you're affecting the Q value, and therefore you're affecting the rates to become uneven, and you're not in equilibrium. But the but Le Chatelier's is the easy way to come up with the fact that B is our correct choice for that one. Okay, and then on this one, uh, greatest solubility. Usually you can compare things by looking at which one has the biggest KSP value. However, there's one little catch on that. Uh, for A, we have zinc oxalate, so a one-to-one -one ratio, barium chromate, a one-to-one -one ratio, and silver bromide. All of those are in a one-to-one -one formula unit. But the CAF2 is in a one-to-two. So when we work out our ice charts, what's gonna happen is that's going to cause some differences. So we actually need to compare the most soluble of A, B, and D with C. And the most soluble of A, B, and D is A because it has the biggest KSP value. Then what we can do is we can say, okay, we want to set this KSP value equal to X squared, one for each of those ions. And this one, however, we need to add it, or set it equal to 4X cubed, which is 2X quantity squared times X. So if we go through an ice chart for the calcium fluoride, for instance, we set up our dissolution reaction we are starting with uh, zero, or I'm sorry, zero of this. We're ignoring this because it's a solid. Starting with zero of this and zero of this, we're adding x, but here we're adding two x. And then of course our k expression has a squared component because of that coefficient. So we get four x squared times x, four x cubed. Uh, so we want to set four x cubed equal to this, x squared equal to this. And we want to figure out which one gives the larger value of x. So for here, we get an x value of 1.64 times 10 to the minus fourth. And here we get 2.14 times 10 to the minus fourth. So narrowly edging out would be the calcium chloride, would be the most soluble by a very small amount. Uh, B and D would both be smaller than that particular solubility. Okay, this one I ended up doing wrong. I didn't notice that it said a 0.1 molar solution. Uh, but 0.1 molar and 3.5% ionized. So let's start by figuring out our Ka. Okay, so if we're 0.35 or 3.5% sorry, uh, ionized at equilibrium, we have 0 0.0035 of both of these. Then we have 0 0.0965 of this. So our K can be found by plugging in 0 0.0035 squared over 0 0.0965, which comes out to be uh, 
zero, 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 one, two, seven. Okay. Now we want to take that K and we want to go, okay, what about a 0.5 molar solution? So if we have 0.000127 and we start with 0.5 molar, we're going to end up with x squared over 0.5 minus x. Let's go ahead and ignore x and see if that works out for us. Uh, so 0.5 times this, square root that, and we get an x value of 0.0001. And that is our concentration of H plus at equilibrium. Pick the negative log of that. And that comes up to be 2.1. Okay, so now we want to come look. Well, we've got 2.1, 2.4, 1.7. So I would go ahead at that point and stop. Uh, you could go back and make sure that you didn't have to, you needed to ignore the X, but there's nothing close enough to really warrant that in that case. Uh, given that you're at a K of this and a pretty decent concentration, that's the same thing. Okay. All right, 35 is a nice trick question when you're in the middle of a test, I like it. So we get an equivalence point here, and we get an equivalence point here. This is after 10 milliliters have been added, and this is after 30 milliliters have been added. And I've got two reactions going at the same time. So we have some sodium carbonate, and that's gonna react with H plus to form sodium bicarbonate. And then additionally, we have even more sodium bicarbonate from before, and those two are both going to react with the H plus to form carbonic acid. Okay, well it takes 10 milliliters of acid to neutralize this to its turning into this completely, and then it takes another 20 milliliters. So we know that because this is, whatever, however much of sodium carbonate we had, we're going to need the same amount to do the second the diprotic component. So we're going to need 10 of these milliliters to titrate this, which means we need 10 milliliters to titrate the original amount of sodium bicarbonate. Okay, so then what's the mole ratio? Well, it's actually one to one. Now it's taking 20 milliliters to neutralize the carbonate because it's it, it reacts with two successive hydrogens. This one only reacts with one, so we need 20 milliliters for this, 10 to react with that, but we have a one to one mole ratio. Okay, 36 was a pretty challenging question, uh, I'm not going to lie. So what you need to do on this is you need to start with the reactions. So you have hydrocyanic acid and K for that. They give you in the problem is 4.9 times 10 to the negative. Okay, and then we have, not upper, we have a nickel complexation reaction. constant for that is 10 to the 22nd, I believe. Yep. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to combine those into the reaction that's going to happen when we mix everything together. So when you mix everything together, you have nickel ions, and you're going to need four hydrocyanic acids to produce our complex. That's four H pluses. Now the equilibrium constant for that is going to be the multiplication of those two. However, we have four of these. So we're gonna to need to multiply this four times or this to the fourth power. So our K for this reaction is gonna be this to the fourth power times this. When you plug it into the calculator, that comes out to be a pretty small number, 5.76 times 10 to the negative 16th power. Right? Now we need to do some analysis. We're now starting with 0.1 molar of the hydrocyanic acid, 0.025 molar of the nickel 2 plus. We're going to drop by x, drop by 4x, assume we start with zero of these. We're going to go up by x, and up by 4x. So the equilibrium will have 4x, x. We're going to ignore the x's here because otherwise it's a math problem beyond a multiple choice test. And also we have a very small k, so that's okay. So we have this k and it's equal to 4x to the fourth, which is going to be 256x to the fourth times x, so x to the fifth, over 0.1 to the fourth times 0.025. So we solve for x, and I'll move that up here. So when we solve for x there, 
we're still not done. Uh, x comes out to be about 5.1 times 10 to the negative fifth. Okay. But x is not our h plus concentration, 4x is. So the negative log of 4x is equal to our pH, and that is where we come out to get the 4.05. So a lot of little things that you can mix up. However, when I did this one, I got this one right, even though I didn't get the right answer, because I ended up with some kind of miscalculation somewhere in there, and I think I got 4.2, 4.3. I don't want the closest answer, and that ended up working out. Um, but that's how you would do the entire thing. Good luck on that one. Okay, follow that up with a nice, basic, easy question. Magnesium nitride. Uh, the magnesium is less electronegative, more electronegative. And so, real simple there, we're going negative 3 and plus 2 for the oxidation states. Nothing tricky on that. Piece of cake. That would be it. All right, 38 on the other hand, not so easy. Um, so now we're looking at a Nernst equation, which is given to you on the uh, front cover of the exam. So when you see this, this is the anode, this is the cathode. So our reaction going on there is the zinc is reacting with the copper 2 plus, makes zinc 2 plus and copper. Okay. So what they're getting in here is they're doing a Nernst equation calculation. So we have non-standard uh, conditions in terms of concentration. So our Q of course, going to be the concentration of zinc 2 plus divided by the concentration of copper 2 plus. Okay, and so zinc 2 plus is 2.5 over 0.1, gives us a Q of 25. Okay, now the equation written out for this particular question is E is equal to E naught minus RT over NF natural log of Q. Now what I recommend for this is I recommend plugging in and solving this. Don't even worry if you have this upside down. Get a value, and then I'll go back and look at whether you should add or subtract it to the voltage. So your initial voltage is 1.1 volts. Okay? You're looking at 8.314 times 298. The N is the number of electrons transferred. That's two. Two electrons go from the zinc to the copper. And then of course Faraday's constant, 96,500. The number of coulombs in a mole of electrons. Oops. Then the natural log of 25 times all of that. This comes out to be 0 0.04, and it's a positive. So we get 1.1 minus 0 0.04 comes out to plus 1.06 volts. However, I just recommend getting a number of 0.04 and saying, okay, well, it's either got to be 1.06 or 1.14. And then ask yourself, well, should my voltage be going up or down? So if I look at my reaction, I've got 2.5 molar zinc and I've got 0.1 molar of the copper 2 plus. So the way I think of that is your little Chandelier's principle trick. And then I have a low concentration of this, a high concentration of this that's causing a shift towards this side. That's bad for my voltage. I want my reaction to be proceeding spontaneously in this direction. That means my voltage is going down. Or another way to think of this is my battery is getting used up. So my concentration of this is going down, my product's going up. It's not as fresh as it once was. The voltage is a little lower. C is my answer. Okay, okay 39. Uh, this is a hard question unless you know this. Uh, but aluminum is produced using electrolysis. Uh, bauxite is, is aluminum oxide. It's dissolved in hydroxide. Uh, and then a, another chemical, cryolite, is added to it to lower its melting point. And then electrolysis is run to produce the aluminum used to be incredibly expensive prior to this discovery because this is very challenging to melt. Gold is often discovered as gold. Um, iron and mercury are both achieved through heating. So mercury is a softer metal um, or softer atom. So typically bound to something like sulfur. Iron we can pick up as rust or like MP304. So you can heat these. You can also heat them in the presence of charcoal to help drive off the sulfur or the oxygen. But, but in the end, aluminum is your best bet to be produced through electrolysis. Okay. That's your most reactive metal of those, so that makes sense. Okay, and then the last question here, this one also looks simple because it looks like you can just do a nice little Hess's Law and come up with the answer. That's not the case um, because voltage is not a state function. And so, so what you have to do for this is you have to find something that is. You have to turn each of these into a Gibbs free energy. Okay. 
So we kind of want to do what you think you do for a nice easy run at this, but we're going to go a little bit harder. So we're going to take um, our bottom equation, the Cr2 plus turns into Cr3 plus plus an electron. Okay. And we're going to use the calculation of Gibbs free energy is equal to negative NFE naught. So for this, we have one electron, so negative one times Faraday. And the voltage. The voltage, now keep in mind, I'm writing this backwards, so I have plus 0.5. So I end up with this being negative 48,250. Okay. Then, I'm going to do the same thing for the first reaction as is, because this backwards plus this adds up to this reaction. Okay. So we have CR3 plus, plus three electrons, yield CR, the voltage of negative 0.73 volts. So our Gibbs free energy for that is equal to negative 3 times Faraday times the negative 0.73 volts, and that comes out to be a positive 211,335 joules per mole. Now, we want to combine these two reactions into chromium 2 plus 2 electrons yields chromium. And we know that this plus this yields this. So therefore, this plus this gives us our delta G naught for this, and that comes out to be plus 163,085. Okay, and that's equal to negative NF E naught. We want to know E naught. So we're going to divide this by divide by negative two times 96,500. And that comes out to be negative 0.845 volts. So definitely some tricky questions in that batch of 10. Uh, probably going to get a couple wrong in there, but that's how you do them.